All right, I guess we'll start. Uh, I know probably Susan will join us and maybe a few others. Uh, welcome back. Again, we already had a good break. Um, if you took one, I know a lot of you didn't, or didn't take a full break or anything. Uh, so again, last week we talked about the Clean Water Act and stormwater management and sort of innovative approaches to, to that and what different people in New York were doing. Uh, so we had some infrastructure news this week, which was how people's Insurance rates, insurance rates in Ithaca were going to go up, but not as much as they were going to go up before. Anybody else have any other infrastructure news of the week before we get into ours? Okay, I'll, I'll launch right into ours. There's a little bit of a stretch to try and make this a quiz, but I'll, I'll start with one anyway. So. Can anybody tell me what molecule this is? <laughs> what specific molecule that is? Anybody know? Strychloromethane. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it is. Um, also called chloroform. So, all right, which is also a Try chloromethane, or <coughs> more broadly known as a, a trihalomethane. Um, so a trihalomethane is a disinfection byproduct. It's something that can that can form when you've got uh, chlorine in the presence of organic material. Uh, it can be these can be chlorines. You can also replace them, for example, with, with bromines and get a get a brominated or oh, bromoform. Maybe the easiest way of saying it. Uh, slightly more toxic. Also a trihalomethane. <coughs> The reason why I'm bringing them up is because of a recent news article covered by a lot of different outlets, uh, including the Ithaca Journal, about the town of Ulysses, which is really just north of here, um, a little bit north, northeast, up, up the, uh, well, northwest, up the west side of the lake. So in Ulysses District 3, Water District 3, so a portion of Ulysses, not the entire town, but um, a, a part of it. There's uh, this article here, carcinogens found in Ulysses Water District. It's not alarmist at all. So, um, sounds like a pretty big deal, right? Uh, has anybody seen this article or read about this stuff? I'm sure you guys have. Lauren, you have? Have you heard about this before or was this the first time? I think, didn't you guys maybe mention in the beginning of the class that there's been issues with this in Bowling Point too? Mm. Did we mention that? I don't I'm not remember. sure. No? We might have. Um, there, well, there is a link to Bolton Point, which again is one of the water suppliers for the for the city, is that the town of Ulysses actually gets their water from Bolton Point. It gets piped all the way up up there. And Ulysses is basically the town of Trumansburg. If I would normally think of Trumansburg, but that's that's within Ulysses. So uh, but I, well, but the city the city of Ithaca gets its water from Six Mile Creek. Not from a Right. And but so Bolton Point, which is actually on <laughs> the east side of the lake, <coughs> pipes its water up to Ulysses, which is on the west side of the lake. But it must go through the city. I mean, it's right, but it's and all, but I also think it, 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 that water that's going to Ulysses is not going to Trumansburg. Not going to Trumansburg. Yeah, that's what I think. Perhaps Trumansburg has their own. Yeah, I think has his own one. All right. I may have just made it more confusing by mentioning Trumansburg. But anyway, the town of Ulysses does have a water district. They get their water from Bolton Point. Uh, so again, Ithaca is served by three main water sources. The, the Cornell facility, which takes its water from Fall Creek. The city of Ithaca facility, which gets its water from Six Mile. And Bolton Point, which takes its water from the lake. Um, all right. All right. <laughs> Oh, I, some guys are working. I thought it was you. Not me. Some guys are working on that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were looking back at me like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> you also made it pretty convincing that yeah. it was you. <laughs> um, okay. So if you look at, I don't have this on, on the website here, but if you look at the article, it shows you the town of Ulysses, their, their trihalomethane concentrations that they found in their drinking water. Uh, they, they measure it quarterly, so four times a year. And they're, they're definitely, on average, they're over the recommended limits. Trihalomethanes, chloroform, bromoform can be carcinogenic if you are exposed to them 
long enough, over, sort of over, over long periods of time at high concentrations. Not really acutely toxic, but um, definitely a problem if you see that in your water all the time. So some interesting things about this article. Uh, I actually have the water quality reports for Bolton, Bolton Point, City of Ithaca, and Cornell. Uh, Cornell and Bolton Point have pretty similar trihalomethane concentrations in their finished water. They're both about 65 milligrams per liter, which isn't great, but it's not, it's not above the limits either. So actually, those two systems have pretty similar uh, trihalomethane concentrations coming out of the facility itself. For some reason though, when it gets up to Ulysses, they have to rechlorinate, they have to de disinfect again, because, again, I'm not sure how many people know this, but when the water's in the pipe, you have to add a disinfectant at the facility that not only disinfects at the facility, but then remains in the pipe as the water flows out of the facility and then toward the homes, and that's called a residual. So essentially what you're looking for is some sort of disinfectant that actually continues to work even as the water is delivered into homes. And chlorine is one good way to deliver a residual. Not all disinfectants maintain a residual, so UV, for example, you can disinfect things with ultraviolet light, but it only really works right there when the lamp is shining on the water, kills stuff, but as soon as the water leaves that, that box or whatever it's in, there's no residual, it, doesn't, it no longer has the ability to kill stuff. Um, chlorine does, and that's essentially what the town of Ulysses uses to maintain the residual in their system once they get the water from Boulder Point. And it's this additional, this, this second addition of chlorine that's taking what is already water that has, you know, measurable and, I would say, somewhat significant concentrations of, of trihalomethanes, and it's adding even more. Um, so that's the problem Ulysses is having. I thought uh, just go through this a little bit. <coughs> okay, yeah, so Ulysses, trihalomethane levels in their water, you can reduce them by running it through activated carbon filters, think of Brita's. Uh, or by putting water in a pitcher and letting it sit overnight. That's what they recommend in the news article. Um, why does that work? Anybody know? This is my like engineering lesson for the day. <laughs> why does it work to put the water in a jar and let it sit overnight? So the heavy stuff falls in. No, good, good idea, but no. It's not settling. So these aren't really, these aren't really particles, which that would work if they were particles. That are volatile. Yes. They're volatile. So this likes to become a gas. All right. In fact, one of the main ways that you get exposed to chloroform over the course of your life is by taking a shower. Um, <coughs> it comes out of the water, volatilizes. Um, so anyway, uh, not to scare you about taking showers, but just saying. Um, Why well, you should run your fan while you're taking a shower? You can run your fan. Your hey, well, um, better. That might be better, I'm not sure, but, but then you're, I don't know, yeah. That'd be like a problem set for yeah. engineering. <laughs> um, and I wanted to just mention this because as a general issue that we have with water quality and, and sort of engineered systems is that what they're essentially saying to do is let's take this water quality issue and turn it into an air quality issue. And we actually do that all the time. So if you ever heard of something like a, like a scrubber, so I'm like, oh, we'll scrub uh, the gas from, let's say, a coal-fired power plant. So if you're scrubbing, you have, sorry, we'll just get rid of this. Okay, if you want to scrub something, you're basically going from, you're taking a pollutant that's an air quality issue and you're turning it into a water quality issue. And a good example of that would be like a coal-fired power plant where you have particulates in, in the sort of the, the air stream that's coming out and you need to get rid of them before it gets discharged into the atmosphere. You would actually expose that air to droplets of water and they would pick up a lot of those particles and then you treat the water somewhere else. If you're going to strip from an engineering point of view, you'd be turning a water quality issue into an air quality issue. <coughs> and again, we do this all the time as well. Uh, for example, if you have methane in your groundwater from your private water well, they always say to aerate it, which basically just means put some bubbles in it. 
uh, you know, bubble air through it, bubble oxygen through it. So you're taking the air, you're running it through the water, it's picking up that, that pollutant or whatever it is. So for example, the methane, it wants to, it wants to volatile. It wants to, it's volatile also, so it wants to escape from the water. And you're turning it into an air, an air issue. But again, much more, in that case, much more dilute air issue. You're not really worried about, for example, uh, the small amounts of chloroform that might come out of that jar of water that then sort of disperse throughout the house and, you know, the wind blows and it's not really a big problem. You, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't want to drink the water, but it would be okay if, in this case, you would put the chloroform into the air and, and let it sort of dilute and disperse. So that's the engineering lesson. Any questions on that? So I just want to say one more thing about the Ulysses plan, which yes. will feed into David's talk, I think. Which is that, because um, I mentioned it to one of the town board members, um, the, you know, it's an issue, a lot of it has to do with the issue of smart growth, because Ulysses uh, didn't, the, a lot of their wells were polluted, the Department of Health wanted them to get on a public water supply system, and the only one that was available was the one on the temp for the town of Ithaca on the west side of the lake, because the town of Ithaca wraps around the lake. And so the town of Ithaca was asked to extend its water mains into Ulysses in, so that they could then have this water supply, public water supply. But they're what you would call, because they're way out there, they're so dispersed, they're the end of a line tank. So people knew from the get-go there were going to be problems because all the rest of the Bolton Point water system, the water can circulate around from right. different tanks. Now my understanding is once they chlorinate, you're, I think I remember 12 days, you're supposed to be moving the water through the system. It's supposed to have a certain, it's designed for a certain residence time, which right. is why they probably have to rechlorinate because they probably Right, that. so they, they, and they knew this was going to, that is why, because, and so it is a case in a lot of um, rural systems <coughs> that just have these NLI tanks, they have some of the biggest problems with trichloral um, methane because, because it's not, it's not the smart way to design the water system. Right. And so the last thing to say about this is that in some of these articles that have been put out, the the supervisor, I believe, or the town engineer for Ulysses suggests like, oh, there are these, these options that we could do to clean the water, like strip it and run, run an aerator. They call it an aerator. They're basically doing this. They're running air through the water to take the trihalomethanes off. They'll, they'll you know, go into the gas phase and, and be stripped off. It's going to cost, it said, according to the article, about seventy to $100,000, um, which is you know, a sizable amount of money, especially for a small town. Which of course they're suggesting that Ithaca should help them should help pay for it. exactly. Uh, but Ithaca doesn't really see, according to the article, Ithaca is not really seeing any reason why it should help them <laughs> pay for their system. And so you get into this issue of like, well, who should pay for this? The, the town of Ulysses for has a problem. Of that guy. They're getting their money from Bolton Point. <laughs> and the chlorine the pipes are running through Ithaca. climbing up a ladder and dumping the chlorine in the tank. That's how it gets chlorine. But this is the question, right? Who should who should pay for their for their water. Yeah. Who should pay for the, the solution to this water water supply issue? Any opinions on that? Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any discussions of uh, end at, like the end of the tap, like installing a Brita filter and everyone's like where they bring in the water? I don't know into their as, house. Is as far as I know, all they've done is this this guidance here. Look at a okay. filter or leave it out on your table. Yeah. I think that's why we have a water filtration plant, that we can avoid Brita filters in every house. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's an option though. We're talking about, Mesa, uh, I think it said 300 people, so I'm guessing maybe 100 households or so. Yeah. Uh, what's cheaper? Maybe to put in an aeration system on their final chlorination tank at the end of that, or to give everybody a Brita filter? Yeah. And then replace the cartridge every three months or something. Right. How many years of Brita filters could you supply to 100 people for $70,000? <laughs> but I, th I think problem. there's a lot of discussions about decentralizing sure. water, right? And, and, and not, not necessarily it being a Brita filter on your tap, but it being where the water comes into your house, that being the filter there, right? I mean, yeah. it, that, we that do seems that. like also, right? We have water softening systems mm -hmm. right. that are essentially point of use. If you have really hard water, uh, the individual homeowners usually responsible for softening that water. So yeah, it's a good question. David might get into some of this, like, why right. do we have so many people out there in the <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I'm not going to frame it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, these problems come up because yeah. it's, it's uh, you know, where is Ulysses getting their water? Well, they're choosing to get it from here, uh, presumably so that it saves them money <coughs> they have to build their own system. Exactly. Uh, but now there's, cause there's an issue with it, and they're saying, well, we can't pay to remedy the issue, even though you might argue, like, yeah, but you save so much money on this on the system that you should be able to take care of it. Or maybe you go to point of use. Maybe, maybe each homeowner should be responsible for paying for their their individual treatment system. Since you're talking about money, do either of you know how much uh, a typical homeowner pays for their water in Ulysses or town of Ithaca or anywhere per year, three? Any ideas? I mean, my point it's would be it's like it's not that much money. A hundred dollars a quart, uh, half a year maybe. Half no, it's more than that. Depends on how much water. You depends, yeah. It depends on the house. How much. Yeah. <laughs> when you have a, and if you have different decent meters, which was does anybody pay meters. as much as they spend on, let's say, gas? No, but I, I, I think it's up around. I should check that. But I think it's up around seven hundred fifty, eight hundred dollars a year for a house for Ithaca. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. much more than I use. Much more than I spend. In the city? Yeah. Yeah. But I, th I mean, I think the range is in there though. It's probably it's more than a hundred. Less than a thousand, I'd say, for a typical house. Just guessing, ballpark. But, um. Okay. Any other questions, comments, and stuff? All right. We'll get to David Kay, speaker for this week, who comes to us from CARDI, that's the Community and Regional Development Institute, and that's part of development sociology. Uh, David's Currently, part of the Tompkins County Planning Board, or was on the board? I Always associated with something. At the county level, I'm on the Planning Advisory Board. Advisory Board. <laughs> so I have no power or authority, just okay. except to advise. You are on the board of Eco Village, is that right? I am, I am chair of the Eco Village Board of Directors for the edu Educational and Not for Profit. All right. And you play the bass, that I know. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. Badly. Uh, so I have to move, I can just do this. Yep. Uh, how many people have heard of Smart Growth? Everybody. You are better educated than the American public at large. Um, so this is my quick summary of, of, you know, kind of why you probably know about it, because it promises a lot of really good things to people that a lot of people like. Open space, protection, infrastructure costs being reduced, which may be the most significant one in relation to water and sewer infrastructure issues. Uh, really, really big one is around uh, automobile dependence and single occupancy vehicles, and how many people drive, have to drive to get everywhere. Uh, general idea of improving the quality of life. I mean, these are all very attractive things. One of the most amazing things about smart growth as a policy agenda, and it is a, it's a set of policies, um, is that it creates opportunities for coalitions across interest groups that wouldn't normally um, have come together. Um, I'm going to borrow now from a bunch of slides from a national organization, Smart Growth America, that <clears throat> is a, it's a, essentially an advocacy group promoting smart growth. So um, it comes across a little bit as an advocacy group rather than as a sort of a dispassionate uh, organization. But I want to kind of present to you sort of the, the why smart growth is great side perspective here. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that sprawl, it's actually a, res a response to sprawl. The term smart growth. Uh, there's a phenomenon in the United States, particularly after World War II, of massive sprawl. Uh, everybody know what sprawl is? If you know, it's almost everybody who knows what smart growth is, but almost by definition knows what sprawl is, but sometimes I find somebody who knows one and not the other. Anybody want a definition of sprawl? Let's, okay. Um, and these are some, some of their images of what sprawl looks like. Uh, <laughs> But it's essentially, it was associated with the hollowing out of American cities uh, into the suburbs. It's not the same thing as suburbanization, but it's closely related to the phenomenon of suburbanization. Suburbanization, and you probably know that we're pretty much of a suburban nation at this point in terms of where population lives. In fact, there's starting to be 
urban type decay phenomenon happening to the early rounds of su suburbs at this point in time. Although those trends, have, there's been some reversal in very recent years with some of the trends. So smart growth is, is the essentially a prescription to reverse and solve the problem of sprawl. And most of my, I work a lot with planners, most of my friends in the planning community will say, well, smart growth was just like a hip name or a, you know, a fancy name for good, what used to be called good planning. Um, but that this has a lot more sort of cachet to it. And again, you know, there's a lot of cool promises here uh, about affordability, about choice of transportation modes, about revitalizing communities, <clears throat> about saving open space out in and farmland out in rural areas. Yeah. Would you say smart growth is synonymous with low impact development, which is a term that I've heard? Uh, probably not, but it would depend on what you mean by low impact development. What do you mean by low impact? I mean, because to me that is more of an ecological. But anyway, go. What do you mean by? I mean, I've I've seen it defined as being pretty similar, and yeah, I was just thinking about whether there are differences in the connotations of the two. Basically, that you're concentrating development, so you have right. less impact maybe on you know the, the natural space and the <coughs> hydrology, the ecology of the system. To me, like the term low impact development has. I mean, there's a lot of ecological principles that are built into smart growth, but one of the critiques of smart growth that, as opposed to say like an eco-village, which embodies a lot of smart growth principles, is that it's it's not really environmentally focused. It's really, it's it's more of a planning idea, and, you're, and as we'll touch on in a minute, you'll see the, uh, you know, one of the most essential aspects of it, which you talk, touched upon, which may be similar, is where development happens, concentration of development in sort of agglomerations of uh, particularly residential, but also there's a big emphasis on, we'll see, mixed use development. Uh, oh, David, so, a yeah. follow up question. Yeah. Is, is gentrification a smart growth gone wrong, sort of extreme version of that? Because you, you, you had this accessibility and things like that. Well, you can have gentrification very independently, whether it's smart growth or not. Like gentrification may be just that a neighbor, you know, movement from one, na you know, from one neighborhood into another, like in parts of San Francisco, that wasn't necessarily sprawl as the alternative. Um, you know, people might say a certain neighborhood is fashionable, they'll move in, and it's poor, they'll move in there, they'll just, the fundamental thing that I think of when I think of just gentrification is property values going up and the negative being, the negative connotation, displacement of people who used to live there. So <coughs> smart growth uh, could be uh, lead to gentrification in certain instances, but you could also have gentrification without invoking any smart growth issues at all. Um, Let's see. So you all know what, do you know it when you see it? Are these, are these examples of smart growth or of sprawl? And, and what would you say? What would you say? Why, what, if I heard a sprawl, both of these sprawl? Both of them, why? <coughs> Any thoughts? They cover a large area and you're probably not gonna walk within the community very far. Both of those very good. Okay. Anybody else want to throw any ideas out there? We'll get we'll get into this a little more in a minute. You wanted the to say something? Transportation and the <clears throat> one on the left, on the image on the left, right? It's all there's transportation corridors and not many alternative routes. And so you have these dead. Right. Everybody's kind of got to get out onto the one main road. So that causes traffic. Uh, drive to reach your neighbors. There's actually a sort of a version of smart growth called new urbanism, which one of its basic guiding principles is. Start with you think. Start with thinking about your street grid and maximize connectivity. So this certainly doesn't maximize connectivity; it minimizes it in a certain way, so that there are multiple ways rather than just one way to get from one part of a community to another. Um, probably can't see these too well. What do you? So I guess these are not necessarily examples of smart growth per se, but what do you see is a, a big difference. I don't even know if you can see this. Can you see that back there? What do you see is something pretty dramatically different about the similar between these two pictures that in some ways is quite different from what you see in the, in the landscapes here. 
makes it a little bit It's most yeah. obvious right here. I think we have like heterogeneity. We have dense areas and, and open space areas right close to each other. So the small parcels of kind of, Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, I would argue these are probably, these homes have some elements of sprawl because they're large single family, uh, very, in certain ways, very low density use of the land, even though the houses are kind of close together. But what I see here that <clears throat> That I wanted to draw attention to is there's a this is almost European in its way that it separates one land use, the agricultural very low density use from from housing. One of the, you know this is going to be a problem probably in terms of sprawl principles and <coughs> smart grid principles because you have these two uses in such close proximity to each other that you're almost certain when this guy starts. Uh, spreading manure on the field, the ability to not upset those people there is pretty low, right? So um, this is actually Cooperstown, New York over here. It's one of the few places in New York State that for a variety of reasons has a similar thing where there's the village is pretty well self-contained in a small area and then you come to an edge. This is, this is almost un-American. And, and if you look at how development has happened in the United States, it's very rare that you see something like that. What well, you see much more often is something like this, where it just kind of spreads out to the distance. It's arguably very like topographic driven for Cooperstown. Yeah, and, and property ownership. You know, there's a bunch of reasons. It's not really, I would say, it's not necessarily strictly policy driven. There's right. a very large landowner that controls a lot of property, but the pattern that you're seeing there is yeah. unusual in the United States for, and there's some unu unusual circumstances. Behind it. It's actually very common in a lot of European uh, countries. And I just want to throw in our backyard here to show. So here's the city of Ithaca. We're moving up into the mall area up here. This is Route 13, and you probably can't see this that well. And then this is this. It's just a continuation going further north into Lansing, and. Any judgments about what you're looking at? Is this more like smart growth or sprawl? Sprawl. And why? Yeah, it's, just, it's pretty low <coughs> density and it's just lots of single family houses with not a lot of preserved open space. Yeah, particularly developments like this one here, you know, where you probably can't see it, but all these little dots are, you know, very large like mansion kinds of places. Anybody live out there? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, one of the things that one of the things that I'm not going to talk about too much, but uh, you know, the smart growth American, most of what we're talking about is like pro pro smart growth. But there are a lot of people who I think, think who I think make very legitimate arguments, basically to some extent that one of the reasons that we have sprawled as a nation so much is because people like it. Yeah. You know, and the market spoke, and what the, what the answer was that came back was sprawl is great. It has some downsides, but there are a lot of good things about it that people like. So, can I ask, are there um, good surveys of uh, home buyers that really validate that? Because I mean, you're just yeah. not buying what exists. So, um, my opinions of what I wanted to be able to purchase, you know, here in Ithaca didn't really matter. Like, you're stuck. Yeah, but, but I mean, I think what you're pointing out to is one thing is that it's changing over time. There's actually now, I would say, if anything, there's an oversupply now in a way of suburban homes. There's a lot more demand for more urban living. Uh, so what people want, and, and there's an undersupply in a lot of cases of sort of more smart growth style homes. So the way that market is moving now, I think, is away from that sprawling development, partly because of economic issues and value issues and demographic issues. Demographic. Uh, demographics <laughs> in particular are pretty important there. Um, but it also, you know, you bring up the interesting question of the relationship essentially between supply and demand. If you go to a particular place and there's nothing that you want that's available, then you can't move into it, right? Unless you have enough money to build it yourself in the right place. So one of the things that you may remember from you know, one of, the, one of the sort of promotional themes, if you will, about the way to frame smart growth is about, and by the way, I should make clear I'm an advocate of smart growth, even though I think it's sometimes oversold, 
is uh, that it increases choice for people like you who might have wanted a different alternative because that's what's missing most often in the marketplace. And what's even more important, what's also true, is what's particularly missing is affordable places that are in locations that sort of would meet smart growth principles. Uh, it's not just, I mean, I'm going to talk a lot about sort of elements in a minute of, of smart growth in particular, but uh, one of the things that this slide highlights, and I'll go to the next one, you know, this is people who do this kind of work have a lot of fun sort of taking like really ugly spaces and making them look more attractive. But, you know, the reason for a slide like this is one thing it does is it highlights the same physical space redesigned, same physical space redesigned become a much more attractive place that makes it much more likely that pedestrians will feel comfortable there, that kind of tries to tame to some extent the traffic flow through there that makes a higher quality of life. And that's part of what smart growth is all about as well. So you can see that's a pretty different kind of landscape. And there's a whole bunch, most of what's happened here is, has to do with design elements. How do you design a place? So I want to emphasize the importance of quality design for making smart growth work. Um, so back to Smart Growth America slides. Why do people care about this kind of thing? You know, the triple E's of environment, economy, equity, or triple E's of sustainability. Well, they also add an engagement to that and the material. And this is like, you know, all the reasons from environmental to quality of life to more time with your kids about why smart growth might be a good thing. Again, trying to build a pretty broad base across all of society for why you might be in favor of this. Um, I'm not going to read these things through word by word, but you know what smart growth does is it promises an answer essentially to the problems that people perceive in sprawling development. Because even though they've chosen it, that doesn't mean that they, they kind of choose the whole bundle, right? And there are a lot of things that people don't like that go along with sprawl, like the amount of time in traffic jams, the amount of time that they have to spend in commutes, uh, their, you know, the kind of thing that you said, the homogeneity of the, of the housing choices that are available, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like promising a response to many of those things. And this is also, in a sense, a politically motivated slide because one of the first things that happens when you start talking about smart growth, what's implicit in that? What's the opposite of smart growth? Dumb growth. Dumb growth, right. <laughs> so what, you know, if you're advocating for smart growth, what you want to avoid a little bit is, as an advocate, is sending the implicit message, basically what everybody's been doing for the past 50 years or so, including you that I'm talking to, is been really dumb. That's not usually a good communication uh, strategy, right? To say how dumb someone else is that you're talking to. So these are kinds of ways about saying, I can relate to you. Like, I'm not against, I'm not telling you you're going to have to give up your entire lifestyle that you've been wedded to for the past 50 years. And you can still be an advocate of smart growth and not be against cars and roads, not be anti-suburban, not be a dictator telling people where to live, et cetera, et cetera. Because these are things that people will think that you're going to be implicitly leading to. And it's true that the smart growth agenda does not, it's, it's not trying to, to sort of dictate in that sense uh, what you have to do. Uh, it's trying to make Fundamentally, it's trying to make the smart growth alternative more more available and more attractive. Now, there are elements of it, however, that some people would say do get into kind of a bit of command and control, telling people what to do. But that's not fundamentally at the core of it. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the, uh, the sort of the, there's a definition of smart growth nationally, and then I'm going to sort of compare that with what New York State has enacted into law. That's kind of where I'm going. So these are the national 10 principles of smart growth. And I'm going to highlight the first five 
because I think they're amongst the most important in some ways. Um, and then I'll go a little more quickly over the other ones. So I'm going to go through each of the first five one by one. Mixed land uses. The basic idea here is have businesses, commercial, private, you know, open space, residential, public, in close enough physical proximity so that you can get from one to the other easily without getting in your car and driving. There's a lot of other reasons for that in terms of, sorry, it makes an integrated community in a small space. Um, that's kind of the fundamental logic. Now, you know, I showed you earlier like something where that it's not like a blind rule, like when we looked at that farm right next to the development, like if you put some kinds of uses in very close proximity, they're not going to work out very well. So this is not mindless about that, but it is trying to put a lot of relatively compatible uses in a close space together so that access to them becomes very easy and is particularly oriented towards minimizing car use and therefore having to use less, um, put fewer of our resources into automobiles and traffic and roads and so on. But David, doesn't that, I mean, in order to do that, you need some kind of zoning and it goes against some of the traditional zoning ideas? Yes. Have? Yeah. No question of that. Yes. Um, but it's not a, the smart growth agenda does not lead by saying we're in favor of zoning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a new kind of zoning, even though there's a lot of zoning, there's a lot of zoning proposals that are kind of behind how you implement some of these yeah. basic goals. Um, another one's to create a range of housing opportunities and choices. Getting back to what we were talking about earlier, so it's not a it's it's a lot of the idea here. It's almost like an ecological concept of trying to create a diverse social ecosystem, if you will, so, in, you know, within an urban kind of context. Uh, compact building design goes along with the idea of trying to use space efficiently. It doesn't necessarily mean building to the density of Manhattan, but it does mean trying to make attractive places for people to live in, to, for more people to live in small areas. So I don't know if anybody has is anybody here from City and Regional Planning? Have you ever taken George Francis' uh, workshop? Not yet. He's a lecturer there. He, he does, he's done a class a few times where he has people essentially envision what the city of Ithaca might look like if it only had a footprint one third the size that it does right now. Basically, by, and it's not by putting in all kinds of skyscrapers downtown, it's by building it's by minimizing the number of single-story buildings uh, and, you know, smart infill and reducing the number of parking lots that we have and things like that. Um, this is actually some images of a, of a smart growth development that was planned for Santa Cruz, California. I'm not sure it's ever been built, but, you know, this gives a sense of sort of the, I, would, I think it's a fairly attractive <coughs> design, but, you know, there's a lot of people in a small space, you can see it sort of from, from uh, the perspective of being on the ground, and this would be like the area that that would fill in in what's currently a factory area. So you're, you know, at some level, in a negative way, you're trying to pack a lot of people into a small place. Basically. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. Um, creating walkable neighborhoods is, it's almost like a, uh, I don't know, like if you've managed to create a walkable neighborhood, uh, in many ways you've probably been fairly successful at your smart growth goals. It's almost like a sort of little indicator of how well you're doing. And I just have two examples here. One where they've actually taken away, they've taken automobiles out of the pedestrian space entirely, which goes farther than a lot of places do, but Ithaca is one of those places which actually still has maintained for many years its pedestrian mall. A lot of other places put them in and took them out. Um, here's more typical where they're trying to create, you're trying to create, you know, a relatively ex attractive space with some protection from the cars that are moving by and something interesting happening on the side and lots of people. That's what people tend to like as a, as a place to be and to 
walk once, they'll use it. Again, very design principles, very important about what works and what doesn't work in making that making truly walkable neighborhoods, as well as sort of the physical placement of things. Um, providing a variety of transportation choices. Uh, I have a picture here of the something I use almost every day, which is the bicycle racks on the buses. So I do not drive. I do not have to drive my car to work every day because I can ride my bicycle to the bus and take it up the hill. Now that I'm an old man, I used to ride up the hill. But <laughs> uh, here's one of my favorite little projects. This is actually from Trondheim, Norway, for as people get lazier and lazier, they can actually get on their bicycles and pushed up the hill. Um, here's one where this is called uh, Bus Rapid Transit, uh, where they've actually put dedicated lanes for the buses so the buses have act, you know, can go faster than the rest of the vehicles, getting you from one place to another, and so it makes it relatively convenient to use the bus. You'll get there faster. A little bit like the high occupancy vehicle lanes that you see in a lot of cities, taking a step further. And then here's there's this whole movement about the National Complete Streets Movement, which is again about how do you design streets so that it accommodates vehicles and bicycles and pedestrians, and essentially tries to think about all the users of that trans transportation corridor. Where is the bus picture? That's actually. <laughs> I think I, I forget. I think it was Columbia, but I have a note about where it is, but I can't remember. It's not in the United States, but there is there are some versions of things a little like that in the United States, where there's bus rapid transit, which is a cheaper version of something like a like a train or a, you know, or a trolley kind of thing, because it's a little more flexible about where they can go. Um, so those were what I would say are like sort of the, you know, some of the key principles. Here's a whole bunch of other ones, Fast, you know, that are, some of them are a little maybe slightly vaguer in terms of how do you do these things, but how do you foster, foster distinctive, attractive communities? That's a goal. Uh, <coughs> preserving open space, farmland, natural beauty, and critical environmental areas. There's a policy element to that, that and that applies. A lot of what people think about when they think about that is, outside of the urban centers you're doing these things but there's some attention that needs to be given to doing that in terms of parkland open space and so on within the urban areas too so it's not a goal to cover every you know the smart growth goal is not one to cover every inch of surface area with structures it's also to create attractive communities um, this one is, you know, the development community, interestingly, large parts of the development of how the home builders have bought into the SMART agenda, and one of the reasons they have is because what the, one of their goals is that number eight, they would love it if people would tell them what they actually, people meaning municipalities, permitting procedures, if you'd tell them what is it that you actually want to see happen in your community, and then make it easy for me to do it, <laughs> as opposed to going through long, convoluted processes with everybody kind of <coughs> taking their licks, trying to stop it. Um, and then some participatory democracy principle at the end. Now I'm going to uh, I save this last one for last because I think it's the one, in a sense, that's most closely related to infrastructure issues, and we've already been talking about it a little bit, which is the idea directing development towards existing communities and a big part of that is also directing development towards places where infrastructure to support development like water sewer and roads etc already exists and is to some extent often underutilized not not used to full capacity so we have a couple examples here of again from Ithaca the basic concept of infill development um, you know a building that's in scale to what else is there, but it's filled in between two existing buildings. That's kind of what happened down here right next to the library at the Cougar Green apartment complex. Um, 
years in af affordable housing. Why are you laughing? Because nobody ever goes to that building. Like but people they, live in it. Don't they have it, the one next to the... Right next to the library, between the library and the mental health building. Right in front of the bus stop. Yeah, there's over. It, it was oversubscribed <laughs> yeah, in terms of demand. Yeah. What about Merrill Lynch? One with Merrill Lynch in the bottom, in the basement, across the street from the from the hotel. Is that the same? That's different. Do they have like to, like totally yeah. opposite problems? Yeah. One is over this there. this was kind of high end apartments. It was yeah. designed okay. and it and it's and they sold you know in terms of demand they sold this out almost oh, instantly. Yeah. Uh, this one here has just been completed. It's actually affordable housing. Uh, Right on the corner of Cuga and Cuga Seneca. and which one? Seneca. Seneca, right. Which is again kind of there wasn't a, you know there was another lower a smaller building there it was torn down and uh, more people are now living there than were living on that spot before right in the heart of downtown. So and that's the part of the older building being torn down. Um, And then this is just to kind of, you know, remind people about one of the one of the issues that comes up is like because we have lots of small local governments in in uh, New York, we have the town of Ithaca doing its smart growth planning kind of around the city as a whole, and then you have the city doing its planning and zoning here. And sometimes they talk to each other and coordinate, and sometimes they don't. Um, just not, this was actually going back to the point that you made earlier on this side about the importance of, uh, on the one hand, I think, well, you know, to add to it, the, point, the importance of thinking about zoning in terms of where water and sewer infrastructure and other infrastructure already exists. So this is just kind of like reminding us that there's a lot of subsurface infrastructure that's really important about that's able to service development, and here's just kind of <coughs> a less schematic scale, just a map about how important these kinds of maps are about which areas are served already by water and sewer and which areas aren't when you're thinking about where growth should go when you're doing your planning and zoning processes. Um, so now that was all general about smart growth. Any sort of overall questions about smart growth and sprawl and stuff like that? I say I'm running rapidly out of time. Okay. Um, what's the relationship between smart growth and water and sewer infrastructure? Uh, well, one, the infrastructure influences growth, and growth influences the infrastructure, right? So there's kind of a dual relationship. Um, and the fundamental idea behind smart growth is prioritizing development to places where infrastructure capacity is underutilized, which I've already mentioned, uh, and prioritizing infrastructure to support existing population concentrations. It's a sort of similar kind of idea. And one of the reasons, one of the hopes that when you're doing that is you're going to actually be able to tell people that. <laughs> This is not only a great planning concept, but it also is going to save you money because you're going to use your infrastructure more efficiently. Um, this is just kind of proving that these are live policy debates that people are thinking about in the real world all the time. By you know, here's one from Cape Cod, the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, talking about how they really bought into the smart growth idea, uh, they'd like to achieve it. However, the towns have not been able to implement this vision for two main reasons. One is the lack of adequate wastewater infrastructure to support increased density in town centers. So it's a little bit possibly, you know, there'd be a version of that in what we were talking about Trumansburg earlier, potentially. You know, if they have a wastewater system that isn't up to snuff right now, you know, it's going to be a disincentive to growth in that community that's dependent on that uh, water system. Um, and then here's another one. I ran across this idea about wet growth, which is kind of an interesting idea about the extent to which both the availability of water resources and the impact of development on water resources needs to be something that's integrated more fully into sort of 
the land use planning way of thinking and yeah, that I kind just of saw the Canadians uh, out on the west coast in you know, British Columbia are doing interesting stuff with that, and they call developing the blueprint. Yeah, well, hi, Blue interesting. For water, yeah. yeah, and this is like I should say these are ideas that are kind of. They're not foreign to basic land use planning ideas, but they're kind of on the fringes of them. They're not really fully integrated into how people think about land use planning, I would say, in my experience at least. Back to Smart Growth America, they actually have a whole page devoted to changing the criteria for water and sewer, water and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, you know, I'm just going to sort of highlight one thing there. Where and how drinking water and wastewater infrastructure is designed, approved, and built largely governs where and how growth occurs. Pretty strong statement there. It's actually surprisingly hard. I believe that because through my own experience, but if you look in <laughs> academic literature trying to say who's, you know, how, is there like a really big research base to support that? I couldn't find very much. I could find it sort of in planning documents and things like that, but not in statistical tests. But what people tend to point to is like the main driver of growth is tends to be more highways and roads more than water and sewer. But I think it may have to do with scale to some extent. Because everybody I know kind of takes that as received wisdom and truth, even though it's not it doesn't seem to be addressed that much in the literature. Um, so they go on, state agencies can give this is what so these are their policy recommendations about what the state and they mean states like New York State when they're talking about the state. State agencies can give preference to water and wastewater projects that will serve higher density development located in or near existing developed areas near public transportation, <laughs> separated from environmentally sensitive areas. So I'm going to point to one other word. So I'm going to move on to looking at sort of how has New York tried to do that in the next section here. And then I'm going to point out another little phrase in here, which is a little tricky. Decisions on infrastructure projects for des designated growth areas can be expedited. That's what they would like to see. So the tricky little thing there is designated growth areas. Who designates those and how do they get designated is the tricky part. I think the, the Maryland Smart Growth Principle had explicit directions on which areas are designated, yeah. and that sort of gets into yeah. your command and control, sort of where. Yeah, and the, the where class, you, exactly. And the classic place is, is Oregon, which is kind of the center of all wisdom about <laughs> smart growth in many ways. And they have policies in place that actually have urban growth boundaries designated, and some other states do, which is like politically never gone anywhere in New York. So now I'm moving to talk about the New York State's most recent version to implement smart growth policy, the Smart Growth Public Infrastructure, Infrastructure Policy Act. So this is language more or less directly out of the law. And I've highlighted some key phrases here. So what this law, which was passed in 2010, does is it augments the state's environmental policy. That, that's a clue right there about something that tells you it's being thought of as, as part of environmental law. It's being thought of as an environmental policy. So, you know, a lot of those goals, those 10 goals, were not environmental goals necessarily, but this is part of environmental law, and that's important to remember in some, some cases. Um, but it also has other things that are important about it. fiscally prudent. You know, everybody wants to be fiscally prudent, of course. Maximizing the social, economic, and environmental benefits from public infrastructure development. So one fundamental thing here is this is about public infrastructure development only. The, the fundamental goal, minimizing unnecessary costs of sprawl development, is what, what's really going on here because there are much more aggressive legislation that was proposed prior to this law being passed that included things like growth boundaries in them. Uh, what got passed was motivated by the idea that the state should not, at the very least, well, maybe shouldn't regulate sprawl per se, because that's the local government responsibility. It should not be in the business of subsidizing sprawl as it has been in the past. Very similar in certain ways 
to the same kind of idea that we were talking about earlier with the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, that the federal, which is about the federal government not subsidizing development in places where there are reasons to think development should not be at all, much less be being subsidized. Um, and here's like a whole list of things that they're concerned about in the law, and includes sewer and wastewater treatment and water. Um, oh, and then there's a reference at the end here to uh, smart growth public infrastructure criteria, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, firstly, what is the law? Who does the law apply to? It only applies to state agencies and authorities of which there are 13 major agencies and authorities explicitly named in the law, and two of them, Department of Health and Environmental Facilities Corporation, have very major water and sewer infrastructure uh, funding programs. Uh, and then there's like 1,200 roughly other possible state, quote, state agencies and authorities that conceivably might be covered by the law. There's actually some debate about who is and who isn't covered. Um, and amongst those, there's a couple dozen that are actually, they may have some state authorization, but they're actually regional and local authorities, water authorities, sewer authorities. And I just listed a bunch of them to give a sort of sense that they, they can be regional, they can be county, they can be municipality level. Uh, so it's kind of a hodgepodge of types of Authorities that but they're an authority. They're author those are mostly authorities. Like the U Utica has a board. Right. Um, I'm not sure whether Utica is on that list, but it, it definitely does, yeah. I didn't put them all up there. The point, part of the point I wanted to make is, of course, this law is primarily targeted at <laughs> other kinds of agencies and uh, authorities other than those that are primarily focused on water and sewer, but this is like, it includes water and sewer. So what, what do you have to do as one of those agencies or authorities to comply? What you have to do is create an advisory committee to sort of help you implement the, the policy, and then for every f project that you fund, you need to do a smart growth impact statement. And in that, you need to attest that the project meets New York State smart growth criteria, quote, to the extent practicable. But if you can't do that, if it doesn't meet it, uh, then you need to justify, basically, if you want to fund it. It doesn't say you can't fund it, it just it says you need to justify why it's important to fund it anyway. Um, so, part of what I want to emphasize is the law is primarily procedural. You have to go through this process. It doesn't tell you what you can or can't do in terms of funding things. It tells you you have to think about it and you have to justify why you're doing what you're doing, basically. Um, and there's this issue about extent practicable. What does that really mean? It hasn't, so far as I know, that hasn't really been tested in court at all. Um, but I wanted to draw attention to some similarities. Remember, this is part of environmental law. Well, one of the most important environmental laws, which many states, but not all states have, and New York has its version, it's called the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Has anybody heard of environmental impact statements? So that law at the federal level and then at the state level, that law is the law that triggers the reviews <laughs> about environmental impacts that in some cases lead to sort of very large reports called environmental impact statements. And in New York, what you need to do is you need to, when it, this is, applies to local governments, not to state governments, what you need to do is you need to look at a project that's going to be, you know, that's proposed for development. You need to determine are there going to be any, quote, significant environmental impacts. If there are, you need to give them a, quote, hard look. These are all terms that the courts use. And then you need to mitigate any environmental impacts that you significant ones that you see to, and I'm emphasizing here that a little different language, but very similar to the maximum extent practicable. So under smart growth law, you don't even have to do it to the maximum extent practicable. <laughs> <coughs> um, I just want to remind you 
I went through sort of the slides about all the national smart growth principles. <coughs> so this is what the, the New York law kind of incorporates a bunch of those ideas but has some variations in them. So these are, <coughs> these are all the ones that I would say, I just kind of grouped the New York criteria to sort of talk about where development should happen, prioritize. There's a whole bunch of them. They're all pretty familiar, similar to what we're in the national uh, criteria, except this one mentions brownfields explicitly, which wasn't in the other one. <coughs> These other criteria are also very similar to the national ones. <coughs> and here are some that I would say are maybe implicit in some of the other ones, but a little more uh, explicitly listed here in the state law. Encourage beautification of public spaces, well, that's part of maybe making attractive environments to live in. State and local government coordination, a particularly important issue in New York because of the number of local governments and the structure of local government here. Protecting the state resources, just very general kind of statement. And then this one is probably the newest, more environmentally, sort of specifically environmentally oriented one about greenhouse gases. <coughs> There are two reports done by an advocacy, a state level advocacy organization uh, called Empire State Future that was working sort of, and we've been in touch with them, they're sort of working in parallel from a more advocacy perspective while we were doing our work, funded by WRI. You know, they looked a little bit about what the Department of Health and Department, the Environmental Facilities Corporation are doing, which is the two, the two water and sewer infrastructure agencies. They have some recommendations in the first report basically saying some agencies are doing a good job, some of them haven't even paid any attention to the law at all. But one thing to remember is just because a law gets passed by the legislature doesn't mean that it actually gets implemented at all. Um, this is their second report which just came out a few months ago, which uh, in terms of, let's look at one of the major water and sewer agencies, basically gives them very high marks for doing a good job, better than most of the other agencies. Um, it says that the law as a whole is slowly kind of uh, gaining traction among state agencies. It's gradually becoming a critical <coughs> checkpoint to prevent sprawl. Still got a ways to go though. Um, they have a bunch of specific recommendations which have to do with sort of broader coverage, uh, you know, bringing more, most of this has to do with bringing more agencies and authorities into strict compliance with the law, making them really implement it, and then that they, that they can't just sort of like have dependent environment, this organization to come along and say they're doing, doing it, but that they should actually make, affirmatively demonstrate how they're complying with the law because there's no sort of reporting requirement really that sort of forces them to say yes we're doing this. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to, we just have a couple minutes right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, five so, minutes. So quickly talk about the work that we've been doing with Water Resources Institute funding that relates to this which has basically been trying to focus a little bit like this advocacy organization on how is this law being implemented in New York. And we've got four papers sort of in various stages of completion. Uh, one of them looks at specifically in detail about how the two major water and sewer agencies are implementing the law. Uh, what kind of, you know, looking in some detail at the kind of impact statements that they write. Uh, looking at a case study in a region, a specific case, single case study of a major proposed development that is actually not a water and sewer agency, but it depends a lot. It's a very large development that has lots of implication for water and sewer. Um, a survey we did of local governments who are not directly affected by the law, but if they want money from the state, which they often do for water and sewer, they need to be a know, to know about it, so we're trying to see do they even know about it. And then a focus on the state's new funding process in general. 
and how SmartQuest has been integrated into that process. So for the two, two agencies, some projects were basically grandfathered in saying, hey, you know, they were already in the pipeline before the law was passed, so we're not going to make them go through this process at all. Some other ones were determined they didn't have to do the, this process basically because they weren't new. The law didn't apply essentially because it wasn't new or expanded public infrastructure that was at stake. So the two most interesting categories were the ones where they said that these projects actually met these <coughs> criteria that we enumerated in the law, or they didn't meet them fully, but they were justified. Anyway, those are the two categories. What we didn't see is ones that did not meet the criteria and got dropped, that were not pursued anymore. And there were some of those that they talked about, but they don't have records of those, so they don't have the documentation of that. Because most of them get modified to try, you know, in, in a sense this is probably how it should work, is most of what happens most often is they work with the proposers to modify it to try and make it possible to say that they have uh, met the conditions of the law to the extent practical. Um, so these are some of our conclusions about that, you know, that basically the critical factor that the agency is going to look at is where is it? That's really easy to figure out, right? Is it in an already developed area or not? So administratively it's not surprising that that very easy to determine thing is primarily what they look at. But we'll note that the municipal center location is not all of the criteria of the smart growth law. And it's not always, we, we're at least not able to determine often in these reviews whether they actually looked about or thought about some of the other criteria or not, or whether they just use this easy to measure one as a proxy for everything else. Um, there were only a very small number. We only got four, maybe five, depending on, because two of them are related to each other. Uh, where they said, hey, this project does not meet the criteria, but we're going to justify it because we want to go ahead with it anyway. So that's a pretty small number. I'll just start out with one because I forget the total number, but there's many, many dozens of projects that were reviewed. Um, and again, they kind of like, is it in a municipal center? That's their key determination, but they say, and this is particularly for Department of Health, water supply issues, we have to go ahead because of public health concerns, basically. That's, that's the common, you know, we can't not respond to this. It's our mandate as the Department of Health to keep people healthy. So we're not going to trump that with some sort of smart growth kind of ideas. Uh, but what they've done is they have Design, they've responded to the need, but they've taken into account smart growth concepts by trying to limit the amount of potential growth that might fit in there unless, it, unless it's in a municipal center. Um, and this didn't come out so explicitly, but I would say another thing that pretty much came out of reviews with these agencies is that they are not this goes back to the growth area designation. The state is not in the business of telling local governments where growth should or should not happen, generally. So if there is a local planning process that said growth should happen here, the state isn't going to say, well, that's not close enough to your municipal center. We're going we're gonna to overrule you about that. So my conclusion about that is that Look, the local planning and zoning is critically important to making this whole concept of smart growth really work out. Um, I think I'll skip this case study of the stamp project because it, um, it's just, except to say there's an example where they uh, they kind of they only did the three. Three of the only three of the you know the 15 or so smart growth criteria were met, and they still funded it and they justified it by saying it's a really big important thing that's going to happen here. 
and we don't want to stop it, basically. Um, uh, and there we are. But, you know, they did think, I think what the point is that this process sort of, they may have thought about it anyway, but it forced them to articulate, at least, how this project related to smart growth ideas. So they had to pay attention to it. You know, the procedure, you could argue, well, they should, if you're like a really strong advocate of smart growth, you might argue they shouldn't have allowed this to go ahead. Uh, but if you're sort of saying, well, the law is beginning to get traction, you could say it at least sort of required them to think about these issues in a way they might not have otherwise and take some maybe relatively minor steps to address these kinds of general smart growth principles. Um, am I done yet? I don't want to go over. I have one minute. Yeah, you have one minute. All right. I'll, you don't so, want to put it in question. So I'm really quickly going to talk about <laughs> the survey of local governments that we're doing. And maybe I'll just do this one, you know, because it's probably the most important one. Uh, were you as a local official, this is a random survey of local government officials in New York, uh, did you know anything about this law being in place? And 59% said no. So, uh, is that surprising at all? No, not at all. In fact, I would have thought it might have been even higher. But I mean, the point is, the point I want to make is... Were they is, supposed to know this? Sorry? Is that critical to... No, no. It's, so, but I work mostly with local governments. I just got finished saying how important local planning and zoning is to the successful implementation of this law. So I would argue, my argument about this is that until you have local officials aware that if they're interested in water and sewer infrastructure or money from the state, they're going to have to be thinking sort of along smart growth principles to increase their probability of getting funding, you haven't sort of completed the system, you know, it's a system of state and local government interaction that makes these things happen. So, with, so, so far this law has only paid attention to one piece of the system. At the very least, the local officials need to be more broadly educated about things have changed in New York than in the, compared to the past. And I think I'll stop there. I have some other pie charts. So we're out of time.